All right, well, let's jump in if we could share the slides. So we have nine new governors who have recently been sworn in or are about to be sworn in even this week from around the country, everywhere from Arizona to Arkansas, Massachusetts to Nebraska, back to Pennsylvania where Rob is right now. Um, so we're uh, excited about these new governors and have been uh, looking at their campaign priorities. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, um, our team has been conducting a lot of research on their priorities. We've been looking at publicly available information from campaign messaging, media, websites, um, and have identified their priorities that relate to pathways to resilience efforts to prevent and address trauma across sectors. So as you can see here, seven of the nine new governors are focused on early childhood issues and education. Six of the nine are focused on justice issues. Six of nine are also focused on homelessness and housing issues. And not, again, six of nine are focused on health and three of nine are focused on equity issues. And so we are excited about this. We believe that these new governor priorities show promise in the extent to which their efforts will intersect with the work of Pathways to Resilience. And if you're on here and you're in one of these nine states, um, feel free to add information in the chat about opportunities that you see in this space. Next slide. So I'll briefly highlight some examples of campaign focus areas. Um, but again, we know there's more out there. And if you're in these states, feel free to add. Um, but in the early childhood and education sectors, uh, Katie Hobbs of Arizona, Josh Green of Hawaii, Maura Healy of Massachusetts have all discussed universal pre-K programs. Uh, we've seen that Sarah Huckabee Sanders from Arkansas, as well as new governors in Arizona, Massachusetts, Maryland, and Pennsylvania are all interested in school-based mental health services. So that's an area we're going to be tracking. Um, in the justice sectors, we have Maryland, Massachusetts, Nebraska, and Pennsylvania are focused on re-entry programming to reduce recidivism. Um, there's also a couple of states, Arkansas and Nebraska, that are focused on mental health programming in correctional facilities. Um, there are also a lot of states that are focused on homelessness and housing issues. Um, we know that Tina Kodak has declared the homelessness issue in Oregon a state of an emergency. Um, and like Arizona, Hawaii, Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania, they're all committed to you know, providing wraparound care and poverty reduction programs. There are also an array of initiatives and priorities related to behavioral health. Um, so many new governors are interested in ex expanding access to care. Um, we know that Katie Hobbs of Arizona has prior experience as a social worker in the behavioral health realm. Um, there are states like Massachusetts and Oregon and Pennsylvania that are focused on substance use and recovery. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of cross-sector programs, um, particularly related to addressing social drivers of health and promoting greater equity in healthcare. Next slide, please. So one state we wanted to particularly call out is my home state of Maryland. Um, and Wes Moore, who's about to be sworn in as governor of Maryland, is setting a really great example by committing to adopting a trauma-informed lens in all aspects of his work. And so, as many of you may know, his own story includes experiences of trauma, um, which have really led him to prioritize this commitment. And so during his campaign, um, he posted on his website a roadmap to make Maryland a trauma-informed, resilient, and healing-centered state. And so the roadmap touches on a variety of sectors and initiatives. It includes cross-sector programs, community-based initiatives, governance models. And so we're going to be keeping an eye on Maryland um, and looking forward to seeing what his administration does. And if we have anyone from Maryland on this call, we certainly welcome any thoughts or comments from you. Uh, in the chat about where Maryland is heading, but we're excited to see that he very explicitly had this focus area in his campaign. Next slide, please. So because Pathways to Resilience is guided by a steering committee comprised of first spouses of governors, we're really excited to learn more about these spouses. Um, they all have impressive resumes. Many have supported efforts that align with the Pathways goals across sectors. Um, so for example, in Arizona, Patrick Goodman is a children's trauma and grief therapist and psychi psychiatrist. We have a couple of spouses who are social workers and others who are focused on children's issues, uh, including in Hawaii. And so we'll be working with them to let them know about Pathways to Resilience and hope to bring additional first spouses into our amazing steering committee. 
So next slide. So as the as the new governors are sworn in, some start December, some early January, some are happening this week. Um, and as state legislative sessions get underway, we believe that this is really an opportune time to communicate the importance of promoting actionable strategies for addressing trauma. And so that's why um, we just released a set of nonpartisan talking points that describe the prevalence of trauma and adversity and make the case that preventing and addressing trauma should be a key priority for 2023 and beyond. And Sarah has just put a link to these talking points in the chat. Um, and these talking points are intentionally general and fact-based in order to appeal to a wide range of audiences and perspectives. They can be tailored. You can add on state-specific solutions. And so we're hoping that you know, you'll use them. Please share them with your networks. Um, and we hope that they'll help jumpstart discussions about specific policies and programs that can be pursued. We're also really pleased to announce the release of another Pathways to Resilience resource, and that's our National Compendium of Trauma Responsive Policies and Programs. Um, the compendium summarizes nearly 90 examples of governing bodies, policies, programs, interventions that states and communities are already leveraging to prevent and address trauma and to promote healing. Um, it's really designed to serve as a resource for policymakers and community leaders. Um, as you know, ideas and options um, that could be explored across the country. Um, so to develop this, we conducted an extensive re review of state legislation, executive orders, reports, research, case studies. Um, we conducted interviews with dozens and dozens of state and local government employees, community organizations, researchers, professional associations, and with people with lived experience. Um, we also solicited input from our expert advisory committee and participants in our state policy roundtable that we hosted back in September. So we're really excited about this. Sarah just put a link in the chat. Um, please go check it out. Um, and just quickly, um, and if you're, uh, if you could put yourself on mute, that would be great. Um, so in the next slide, just very quickly, the compendium is organized into two sections. Um, section one looks at governance models, such as staff or leadership positions, statewide cabinets, commissions, task forces, offices. Um, and today we're going to hear about two of these. Um, Tia is going to talk about the Governor's Office of Wellness and Resilience, and Rob will talk about the Pennsylvania Office of Advocacy and Reform, which houses the HEAL PA Coalition. And then the rest of the compendium um, gets into first some broad state policies and statements, like how Delaware has an executive order to make Delaware a trauma-informed state. And then it digs into policies and programs around all these areas you can see on this slide from preventing re-traumatization, training, assessment and screening, um, intervention programs, behavioral health, community services navigation, mentoring programs, and data connect data collection. And so the compendium includes a lot of great examples, um, but if you're aware of other policies and programs in your state, as you take a look at it, that you want to make sure that we're aware of, um, you can either, you can uh, email us, um, you can see our email addresses here at the bottom, but we would love to hear from you if there are other ones you all are working on um, that you want to make sure we know about. So with that context, I am going to now turn to our guests for today's discussion so we can take down the slides. All right, so this is the fun part where we actually get to do some questions and answers. So I'm going to ask, uh, first, we're going to hear from CTIP. Um, so I'm going to ask Jesse Kohler and Jen Kurt um, to start us off. And so Jesse, wondering if I can hand it to you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about CTIP's work and priorities. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much, Tanya. It's great to be here with everyone. Um, I'm going to put slides back up very quickly to just go over CTIP at a very high level, and then we'll take them down. Um, Jen's gonna go over a lot more of our uh, policy priorities, but just to discuss CTIP at sort of a, a 10,000 foot level um, in line with other national organizations like Pathways that's doing great work at the state level, we're focused at the federal level to support communities for a healthier, more just and resilient society. And so we were founded in 2015 with two main goals. One was that there was not a significant federal advocacy voice at all um, to promote trauma-informed care. At that point, very few uh, congressional offices knew about the ACEs study, for instance. There was not a great recognition of how trauma is a root cause of so many social drivers. And then within the trauma-informed uh, movement as a whole, 
there was so much siloing going on that we weren't creating a comprehensive view of what a truly trauma-informed society could look like, what a transformed society looked like. It was operating within the systems and silos that existed, which are indicative of a traumatized society and system itself. And so we've really worked to create that comprehensive vision and uplift voices and advocacy to congressional offices. And we've seen so much progress over the last seven years. And last year was our first year with a full-time staff. And we saw a huge uptick in progress last year alone with that capacity. And we look forward to that continuing to grow. After the pandemic, the pandemic obviously did not create the need for trauma-informed care or healing-centered engagement, but it certainly exacerbated the need. And alongside with the pandemic, this word of a syndemic became much more palatable as a root cause driver of so many different social problems. And we know that trauma is at the root of many different problems that Congress and other legislative bodies are trying to reckon with. And so we're working toward a systemic approach to prevent trauma rather than just treat those, uh, those health and social problems that arise, right? We're trying to get away from just patchwork policy and really drive transformation at its root. And so the way that we look at that is through a public health pyramid. And we're so often our society looks at just the treatment side. And I think that what we're trying to do as a trauma-informed movement as a whole is really work toward a more systemic approach, work toward that primary prevention. So that way we reduce the amount of treatment that's necessary while also bolstering strong intervention and treatment. So that way we heal the trauma that currently exists in our society and recognize that intergenerational trauma does exist, that there has been an immense amount of hurt and harm that, that is currently in place in our society that needs to be treated. But also if our society is able to take a more preventative approach, we can prevent upfront a lot of the trauma that continues to be perpetuated through systems. And so that's the importance of systems change. And that's why we are really trying to address trauma-informed policies and practices. And so CTIP's work to advance this um, policies and programs um, through a grassroots strategy that includes shaping policy, which again, Jen's going to talk about at a much deeper level. We work to empower advocates because we recognize that that groundswell of support around the country is going to help sustain momentum towards systems transformation, as we know that this is going to take a long time, but we can also be strategic and capture wins along the way. And we work to amplify community voices, and I'll get into um, a particular initiative that we're currently building out, Press On, and how we hope to continue to amplify community voices and bring all of these um, interlinking uh, initiatives together. So our approach is really to build relationships with congressional offices, with stakeholders like yourselves, with people in communities all across the country that are driving this work, foster a dialogue to learn what is working in, the, in communities, what is still needed in communities, what is going on at the congressional level that we can sort of support and add momentum to, we seek those strategic opportunities through strategic communications and strategic policy to continue to promote and further and advance the movement. And all of this uh, is driving racial and social justice as well. We have a number of statements about how trauma-informed care and anti-racism need to go hand in hand, how accessibility, belonging, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice need to be a part of the trauma-informed movement. And so we continue to seek those opportunities to build bipartisan support for what is really a nonpartisan issue, because as we look at the trauma-informed movement, we know that regardless of the paradigm that we are approaching this from, trauma is impacting communities and people and constituents. And so we can really drive this forward regardless of um, who is in office, who we are advocating to. And like Tanya was talking about, there are strategic ways that we can discuss these problems to continue to advance trauma-informed policies and practices. I want to take a quick second to just recognize an incredible human, Dan Press, who was really the energizer bunny for uh, CTIP from its launch until we got staff. Um, and he unfortunately passed away last year, but his lasting vision is now encapsulated in what we're building out through Press On, which is a coalition of coalitions that connects our work at the national level with partner organizations 
to state organizations that reach all the way down to the grassroots and connect coalitions of people because we have heard and recognized that a lot of times advocacy work can feel lonely and it can feel isolating. And so connecting those people, connecting the advocacy work to the practices that are taking place in communities is so, so critical. And so as we continue to build this coalition of coalitions, we are working to hear from the experiences that folks are having in the grassroots, uplift good experiences, good practices and policies that are being implemented at the state and local level, uplifting those to a national um, perspective so that others can learn from those and we can de-silo the movement a bit, but then also coordinate mobilization efforts broadly, like Jen's going to talk about with our efforts for the 118th Congress in a bit, and really be able to build momentum for the long haul to, like I said earlier, really transform systems in the way that they need to be transformed in order to prevent trauma and foster resilience broadly. And so that's just a quick overview of what we're doing. I'm happy to put my email in the chat and don't hesitate to reach out. But again, on the policy and legislative efforts specifically, I know that Jen's going to speak a lot more to our efforts for the 118th Congress, a lot of what we achieved in the 117th Congress, and we're, what we're looking forward to in the future. Um, so I hope that that was five minutes. I lost track of time. Today, so, um, <laughs> great, I'll end great. There. Thank you so much, Jesse. And yes, with that, we're going to turn to Jen. So Jen, we know that CTIP has advocated for federal legislative action, um, as, as Jesse just talked about, including the Resilience Investment Support and Expansion from Trauma Act. And so I'm wondering if you could please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about the act and, and what you think it could accomplish. Great, thanks. And thanks so much for having us on uh, this call. And I see some familiar faces, but many of you I don't know. So uh, it's great to be with you all. Thank you all for your attention and the work that you're doing. Uh, my name is Jen. I'm the Director of Government Affairs at CTIP, and that means I work to develop our policy priorities that are responsive to sort of the needs and cries of our communities, um, as well as being the liaison for the White House, the federal agencies, and Congress. Um, the Rise from Trauma Act is a great place to start the conversation. Um, it's really our North Star bill. Um, we were excited to get some movement on it, and I can speak to that in the last Congress. Um, but as Justy mentioned, I, and, and many of you know, these legislative bodies really work in very siloed ways. And so they often develop um, solutions in, in a policy sense to symptoms of the trauma problem, right? Like more treatment, um, more intervention, more, um, you know, at later responses. And I think the Rise from Trauma Act would be really um, an important step, initial step in getting us to focus on prevention at the community level. And so there's a, a number of provisions in it, but I'll just highlight three that we're really excited about and that we really work to communicate to lawmakers the importance of. The first is a new grant that would fund community-based coalitions that are coordinating stakeholders in different um, sectors to target local services to address trauma. And we've seen some of these coalitions come up in local communities and even at the state level, uh, but there's no dedicated funding, which is really essential to sustaining this and to demonstrating these best practices within these um, groups. And so that funding stream would be so critical. That's one of the things that's in the bill. The other is um, it enhances federal training programs at Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Justice, Department of Ed, Education, um, that would provide more tools, training, resources around what is trauma, how does it show up in people's lives um, for clinicians who work with children, teachers, school leaders, first responders, other folks in the community. And the, the last piece is that it establishes training and certification guidelines to enable insurance to reimburse community figures, um, like mentors, peers, faith leaders, to do that work to address trauma. So actually allowing that to be reimbursable labor um, that's currently being done um, in a way that is uncompensated. Um, and so in the 118th Congress, we were able to get this 
uh, passed in the House, but it did not make it through the Senate. Uh, but that really shows a lot of um, traction there and our ability to educate on the importance. So we're going to keep pushing for that in any way possible. Great. Thank you, Jen. So now we'd like to talk about how legislative and executive authority authority might be used in the upcoming year to promote cross-sector engagement. And so for those of you in the audience, feel free to respond in the chat in terms of where you see opportunities for cross-sector success in your state and community or sector. Um, but Jen, uh, do you want to weigh in on how, how we might see legislative and executive authority used in the upcoming year related to cross-sectors? Sure, absolutely. So the last Congress, which was the last two years, was a really, really active time. A lot of major legislation was passed, which put a lot of funding into different departments and agencies. And I think with the current um, split between Republican control of the House and Democratic control of the Senate, we may see less of that. So we may actually see less coming out of Congress. And that's why we would turn to executive authority or work at the federal agencies um, to really be the place where we'll see a lot of ability to create that transformation. Um, I'll point to two pieces um, just to start. So one of the things that we are um, working on and engaging on with the Department of Health and Human Services is their new equitable long-term recovery and resilience federal plan. ELTRR, and I can actually post a link to it in the chat, but um, later, um, but what it is, is the HHS got together all of these different agencies that usually don't communicate. So HUD, Department of Veteran Affairs, Department of Education, Department of Energy, to come together and talk about how can we build resilient communities? How can we use existing statute and existing funding to ac better accomplish some of these goals that need a cross-sector solution. So they have a ton of recommendations about how we can braid and blend existing funds with existing authority. So we really wanna see that federal plan be enacted. And um, we plan to work with HHS to figure out how we can help um, get that funding braided at the community and local and state level. Um, but the other piece is that these three major bills that I sort of alluded to, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act and the American Rescue Plan Act were passed over the last two years since the start of the Biden administration. And they have a lot of money, um, a lot of money for state and local governments that they have not yet, the state and local level have not yet determined how to use it, but there's a lot of flexibility. And so we plan to sort of serve as a watchdog and help make sure that it's implemented using a trauma-informed lens um, and as an example, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act had a lot of money in there, a billion dollars for school mental health, um, and then another billion of dollars um, that was very flexible. And so we're working with the Department of Education to provide resources and guidelines for state education agencies on what they can use that money for, and really emphasizing this a prevention approach, a school-wide approach, really explaining what trauma-informed really is and what it isn't. Um, and so doing that kind of work, I think there's a ton of opportunity to do that kind of implementation related work. The last thing I'll hit on, sorry, um, there's a bill that we were able to get passed uh, last year called the Post-Disaster Mental Health Response Act. And um, we're really excited to get that win. This bill would allow um, community-based mental health response after disasters, like a natural disaster or a terrorist attack or a mass violent event. Um, if it receives an emergency declaration now, um, some of the federal agencies will actually re reimburse the community to do sort of peer support groups and educational events on trauma and things like that. So we really wanna make sure that communities are using that if they're facing disaster. And that's another thing we're helping implement. Great, thank you, Jen, super helpful. Um, and again, feel free to put any questions or comments in the chat as we go. We welcome that. Um, and I have one other question for you, Jen, um, for now. Um, could you just talk a little bit about how CTIP plans to support states and communities in the upcoming year? Absolutely. I, I mean, I touched on a few things. I think being 
a watchdog and partnering with folks who do work on the state level and the local level to make sure that these states and these uh, towns municipalities are applying for the funding that's available and that they're using it in a way that is implementing these cross-sector and trauma-informed um, uh, initiatives is really critical. And so um, if you are interested in helping do that kind of work and you have those relationships at the state and local level, but you just don't know what to ask for or, or how to talk about it, we would love to you know, advise you and help support you in doing that. Um, we are doing a, a lot um, actually. So I only, I'll only highlight a few things, but um, you know, one of the things that we're doing more is trying to connect people at the state and local level who are doing this work to federal funding. And so while we're pushing for that additional grant program in the Rise from Trauma Act, we know that there is funding that already exists. There are many federal grant programs, but um, oftentimes people at the state and local level don't know about them, don't have the capacity to apply for them. So we're trying to really build that connection and help connect people on the state or local level to the funding that already exists to do this kind of work and creating more communication and access around that. Um, I know Jesse put in the chat, we have CTIP CAN calls, which are community advocacy network. So every uh, third Wednesday of the month, we bring folks together who are interested in learning more about policy and doing some advocacy work, um, give them updates on what's happening in DC. It's a great place to stay in touch with us. Um, and then uh, Jesse alluded to, uh, we're launching a new campaign on January 23rd. Um, it's called the Take on Trauma Campaign, which um, is really encouraging all uh, members of Congress for the 118th Congress to really take trauma seriously. And um, we've partnered with some really great senators and members of Congress to launch this campaign. And they've sort of helped us make the case of why this is so important. And we've asked um, individuals to just sign on. We've created a one page letter that we will send to every congressional member um, with a list of their constituents who have signed this and who care about this. And we're really encouraging these members to meet with people, to meet with their constituents who care about this and have those conversations because those relationships are so important. I think making the case like you all mentioned with your talking points that you've put out, developing these relationships and having these conversations are so important in doing this work. And so through our CTIP CAN calls, through our Take on Trauma campaign, we're really trying to help boost that education um, and equip people at the state and local level to really understand how to engage and to be able to connect them to those engagement opportunities. That's great, great. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, so now I'm gonna transition to look at how this work is being done at the state level. We started with the federal, and now we're gonna go to the state. So um, Tia, we're so thrilled that you were able to join us from Hawaii today. Um, so I'm wondering if you could please introduce yourself uh, tell us about your role. Tell us about Hawaii's efforts in this space. Thank you, Tanya. Um, aloha, everyone. Good morning. It's uh, 1030 over here. I'm on Oahu uh, in Honolulu, um, and I'm just very grateful to be here and be invited to this conversation. That was so helpful, Jen. <laughs> Thank you for all of that information and my my mind is spinning, so I'm I'm I'll I promise to focus on what my coolie, my responsibility is on this call. Um, I am currently um, for the next six days uh, the project director for a substance abuse and mental health services administration um, federal initiative over here called Data to Wisdom, a SAMHSA grant that I'm um, running through the Department of Health, uh, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Division, um, and in uh, in in that capacity. Uh, I'm the chair of the statewide trauma-informed care task force that we have been running for the last year and a half over here. Um, and with that task force, uh, it's it's with 11 members, voting members. It was legislated um, in 2021 to develop a task force um, with all the major state departments, um, child-serving state departments, um, to be specific, uh, with some some nonprofit partners and some um, uh, major players and um, system partners within the child serving system. So within that task force, we have been working diligently to create a framework 
to recommend to the legislation, uh, the legislators um, in, at the end of this this 2023, uh, and that that report recommendations report will um, hopefully outline how the task force has um, envisioned implementation of trauma-informed care throughout the state departments, how we will address specific impacts of COVID-19 um, within our state departments, and how we will improve um, major outcomes as it relates to mental health needs um, and over -represent disproportionate representation of Native Hawaiians and Indigenous populations um, within our state systems and, and do so through trauma-informed, through implement, implementing trauma-informed principles. So that task, from that task force, um, <clears throat> we're a three-year task force, and from that task force, we uh, were, um, we had successfully introduced a bill last session um, in 2022 to create an Office of Wellness and Resilience, um, came up with the legislation and and kind of thought of it as uh, our sustainability plan for the task force recommendation. So task force is gonna work for three years uh, on a monthly basis doing collaboration calls. We're under sunshine law over here. So um, we are doing the work on top of our, our full-time jobs um, as being appointed by the department directors to participate on this task force. And um, from that framework that we're developing currently, um, we decided to create, to introduce the creation of an office to implement that framework, to implement the recommendations within the report um, there, and to make it a sustainability of the task force work instead of having it end up on a shelf somewhere, a uh, lovely little report of recommendations to actually um, dedicate staff and an office to implement the recommendations and really um, really basically uh, put a lot of uh, effort and fiscal um, support to the next steps of that recommendation report. So successfully got through the legislature last session and uh, was able to establish this Office of Wellness and Resilience that is a statewide office to be housed in the office of the governor. Um, over with, with all the powers of the governor. Um, and I got appointed about three weeks ago to be the executive director for that office. Um, very exciting. Uh, I say that with hesitation because it is very exciting. <laughs> it's also very overwhelming. Um, I've had in my mind for the last year, oh, we're going to do this for the executive director. We're going to set them up for this. We're going to support them in this way. And, we're, and I've written all of the content to have somebody else implement it. Um, so upon my appointment, uh, we are now, um, we meaning me are is now in in the in the role on the 18th, starting on the 18th uh, in a week from today. Wow. So um, we that office will have some very specific um, tasks that it is going to um, address. Uh, and Similar to what Jen was just speaking of, we're looking at creating um, an opportunity to uh, have a social determinants of health dashboard to find a baseline of needs for our communities. Uh, we have within our states, uh, within our state, obviously very diverse communities um, separated uh, by islands, obviously, with very different needs, both rural and urban um, specific needs as many states do. Um, we also, minus the separation of uh, the ocean, uh, we also have a specific charge to uh, look at federal funding opportunities and kind of do a fiscal mapping piece around what are we currently spending funds on? How are we uh, addressing the reimbursement? Um, really wanting to look at equity, uh, mental health equity and, and parity as it, re as, as it pertains to um, uh, physical health being as uh, equal um, to mental health. And very excited to say that the gov our governor, our new governor, Governor Green, has made that a priority in his, um, in his current agenda. Uh, he is a medical practitioner in ER doc by training and has been in the legislature um, for several years. 
Uh, and so is very aware of the emergency needs uh, that happen in our rural communities as well as across the state. Um, there are several other functions at the, at the Office of Wellness and Resilience uh, that I will um, drop a link in the chat for, so I won't spend too much time going over the details, but those are the big ones that we're really looking at is, is uh, the social determinants of health piece, cross really thinking about um, being a, an incubator for the state to um, collaborate and coordinate the reform efforts um, that are happening within our systems uh, around trauma-informed care and resilient practices. We have amazing um, ancestral knowledge within our cultural practices here that we uh, have been specifically uh, wrote into the legislation to identify and capture um, and look at how those um, place-based evidence uh, practices are, in, are providing positive outcomes um, for folks that have high ACE scores and hopefully doing preventative work um, to look at how to um, build resilience and, um, and have positive impacts on health and wellness. Wow, congratulations, Tia, is very exciting. And good thing you did all the preparation so you know, you know, that this person is now fully prepared and has everything they need. Um, but really, they're so lucky to have you. It's really, really exciting. Um, Tia, you mentioned um, Governor Green. Is there anything else you want to share about the governor's priorities and, and how they align with this work? Anything else you want to add? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Uh, we do, we just did a um a briefing yesterday to the House Committee on Finance, and we'll be doing a briefing to the um, Senate Committee uh, on Ways and Means in a couple of weeks. And part of his testimony that he provided uh, was his, um, his uh, recommendation to request continued funding for the office. Our funding is only for one year, which started July 1st, 2022 and lapses July uh, third, June 30th, 2023. So he requested extending that budget um, for the biennium as we're um, going upon that uh, right now. Um, he's also, so he's, that was one of his three priorities um, fiscally uh, to fund this office, which is fantastic. Um, the other piece of his priorities uh, to increase the, uh, obviously to increase federal fund coordination um, support housing policy as it relates to the um, interwoven um, nature of mental health and houselessness over here in Hawaii, as you stated in your previous slides. It is a um, very important issue that we are um, taking, that he is taking very seriously um, and has uh, dedicated one of his priorities to houselessness and and um, housing policy. Um, another one of his priorities is what I'm very excited about is um, requesting a position to create a statewide mental health policy coordinator, um, the first of its kind for us here, um, but dedicated to mental health uh, and um, to coordinate those um, efforts across the state is going to be, uh, uh, it's an amazing ask. So I'm hoping that the legislature will support and we'll be able to collaborate with that staff person if it gets uh, approved. Um, but his he has coined himself as the um, Health and Human Services Governor um, and is very, very uh, much so in line with looking at mental health parity, um, not just payment parity, payment equity um, for practitioners. Uh, one of our largest uh, issues that we're facing as are most states is workforce. Um, and our availability for um, staff, qualified staff, um, growing our local population, um, capturing our pre-service training uh, you, young professionals, um, and very specifically focusing on capturing that um, local population and building our local population. We depend heavily on um, folks coming uh, especially in the education field, to get recruited to be teachers. And they get here, the pay is so low, um, the housing prices and the cost of living is so high, and the turnover is intense, not only in the education field, but uh, of course in the human services field and the health field as well. So that is something that we're hoping to coordinate and collaborate with the other um, positions within the governor's office and the governor himself has um, made it a very much a focus effort for his upcoming um, agenda. 
Very exciting, Tia. Exciting that you're going to get to continue this amazing work. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for all the uh, everything in the chat. I know there's been some questions and answers there. So thank you for that. I'm going to turn to Rob next um, so we can get him in. Um, Thanks, more resources. Um, so Rob, thank you, thank you for being here from Pennsylvania. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about yourself um, and your work in Pennsylvania implementing policies and programs within the Attorney General and Governor's offices. Thank you so much. And I hope you can hear me. Um, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I want you to know that really what I'm thinking about is why is Tia so happy? So while she was speaking, I went online, it's 78 degrees in Hawaii, of course. And what is it? It's like 35 degrees where I am. So um, all I can say is in the next seven days, not that I look, are all going to be about 80 degrees and sunny. <clears throat> okay, so let's return to Pennsylvania. And I would be much more trauma responsive, by the way, if I just had a week or so in Hawaii. Anyway, so my background is I have an unusual uh, background for this work, um, and I have been in the law enforcement world, believe it or not, criminal justice for about 40 years. I look very young, but I really am very experienced. Anyway, and um, I uh, was a federal prosecutor. I was an assistant U.S. attorney in Washington, D.C. I was in the Department of Justice, came to Pennsylvania in the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Philadelphia region, and then in 2017 came to uh, the Attorney General's office. Um, I will say the reason that I've gotten involved in this in the very 10 second version is I saw so much trauma and I didn't have a word for it until I learned about it. And I was fortunate to meet some extraordinary uh, trauma experts, including Sandy Bloom and others. And, um, you know, they, uh, it took off. It was literally a light bulb going off and saying, of course, without even hearing the phrase, it's a root cause of all the problems. It was clear. It made it made it so clear to me what was happening. And so many of the people who were getting involved in the criminal justice system and juvenile justice system had been exposed to trauma or traumatized. So anyway, when I came to the attorney general's office in 2017, it's hard to believe it's six years. Josh Shapiro, who is now the governor-elect and will be inaugurated next Tuesday, he was the attorney general and he had just been elected. And I had said, some, I talked about some of my priorities uh, coming on and one of them was to create a trauma-informed Pennsylvania. Now, I will fast forward and just say that I had the opportunity of meeting people all over Pennsylvania. I've met, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of people across Pennsylvania and from rural, suburban, urban, and there were many different levels of interest in uh, pursuing a trauma-informed approach. Um, but fortunately, in 2019, Governor Wolf announced the creation of an Office of Advocacy and Reform. Um, and in January of 2020, there was a think tank of about 25 people. Um, I was one of them. I was the only one from law enforcement, but we all came together and created a report and we worked um, really for the first six months, then we divided into what are called action teams. So we have a health action team, we have poverty, we have racial and communal justice, we have child abuse, child, and we have both the, the executive director of Heal PA and our child advocate right in the middle of my screen, Marianne McVoy. Um, and so, um, and very good, very good. And, uh, and I, I was one of the co-chairs of uh, criminal justice. And anyway, make a long story short, um, we have spent the last really now three years trying to put together a package and understanding a framework and a foundation to um, bring to the state level an understanding of what trauma is and how to, figuring out how do we get it out? How do we train people, educate people, um, I have to say Marianne, and not just because she's in the middle of my screen, but I will say that Marianne has done an extraordinary job in terms of implementing a lot of stuff that just needed to happen to make us a really functional uh, organization. And at the same time, and I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, we have reached out to a lot of the counties. There are 67 counties in, in uh, Pennsylvania, and 20 of them have 
county or community trauma-informed coalitions. And that's pretty good. I mean, we can do, there's 67, so we have a ways to go. But the bottom line is there is a lot of interest in this work. Um, and just tomorrow, there's going to be a conference bringing law enforcement officials together from all of the state on um, essentially uh, the, there's a program called Handle with Care, and it's bringing law enforcement and, and education together with this idea of how do we help a child who's been exposed to trauma. So the bottom line is we have really brought together a couple of hundred people in within Heal PA, um, and we have we meet uh, fairly often. Um, we have just gone online again, thanks to Marianne and um, some of her colleagues uh, in the governor's office. That they have, um, we have now HealPA.org, which really houses a website um, for everything Heal PA. And there's a companion site, Resilience PA, which is with the United Ways of Pennsylvania. So they are also assisting in kind of the community outreach piece. So we have all of this. We also in the criminal justice area because so what, what we're finding is, and again, I, I, I believe me, I could go on and on. So shut me up when you get a chance. Um, I, you know, we have a lot of issues with violence in Pennsylvania, a lot of it. And Pennsylvania is really, I mean, Philadelphia is experiencing horrific levels of violence. And so when we look at it, um, we have to figure out how do we bring really all of these teams together to help prevent people who have been exposed to trauma from then going on and getting involved in the criminal justice system and juvenile justice system. And that's been the work of what we've done. So in November, um, when HealPA.org went live, we also issued a report it's about a 200 page report and it's never been done before as far as I can see, but our team of 107 people came up with a report on how to create a trauma informed criminal justice system. And I know Becky Haas is on this call somewhere, but uh, she does phenomenal work in all sorts of places in the United States. This is along those lines within Pennsylvania. It's the idea of how do we really we need a criminal justice system, maybe you'll disagree, but I believe we definitely need one and a juvenile justice system that's humane and fair and that does not re-traumatize. And we have over 150 recommendations in that area. So the bottom line is that I think that where we were three years ago and where we are today is night and day. And I think we've made tremendous progress and it's, it's really exciting. Not as exciting as I would be if I were in Honolulu. <laughs> We'd all be better in Honolulu. We're all going to come visit you, Tia. <laughs> thank you, Rob. Um, that was really helpful. Thank you. And I know you've been working at this for a long time. And I see Mary in here. It's great to see her and Rob. Um, so thank you all for your amazing efforts in Pennsylvania. All right. So we just have, I see there's a lot of activity in the chat. Jen, thanks for answering so many questions um, that way. That's great since we only have a few more minutes. Um, but we have two final questions that I wanted to ask all, uh, Jen, Rob, and Tia. Um, so the first one is, and I'm also going to invite folks to put stuff in the chat, but um, we believe it's important to celebrate the successes from the past year as we look to the future. So I'm wondering if each of you can tell us what you consider to be your biggest win in 2022 and your biggest hope for 2023. And for those of you in the audience, you, you feel free to respond in the chat with your biggest win and hope for 2023. 20, uh, um, but Jen, I'll have you go first. Oh, I was like, okay, they'll probably start with Rob. We'll have a little bit of time. To <laughs> I, <can go> to <laughs> <this one. laughs> um, I really was so encouraged in 2022 um, with the increased reach of our work. Um, so we had an 172% increase in the number of people who are signing on to our calls to action and our outreach to Congress, which really made a difference in being able to achieve what we wanted to achieve. For example, we had like a 500, almost 600% increase in funding for trauma-informed schools, almost 600% increase federally in uh, funding for trauma-informed schools. 
We doubled funding for the Interagency Task Force on Trauma-Informed Care, which is going to come out with some great recommendations on trauma-informed care, we hope. Uh, we're working on it um, on a national level. So we were, yeah, we we're just really encouraged to see um, you know, how many people were really mobilized around taking some action um, around trauma-informed care. And our hope for 2023 is to really explode the amount of education we're able to do of policymakers on what is trauma and the need to address trauma, um, especially across federal agencies. Um, you'd be surprised how, well, maybe you guys wouldn't be surprised how um, lack of under, how much lack of understanding there is, but really ho hopeful and encouraged by some of the meetings we've had even over the last couple of weeks. That's amazing, Jen. Thank you. Rob, what about you? Uh, a success from 2022 and a hope for 23? Well, I think what we've done is we've gone from a group of people who really were very excited about doing the work. I won't say as excited as Tia, but can't help myself. But anyway, I would then say, um, but the, the real important thing is we are really now a, an organization which really has um, direction um, and we have the website, which is really important. We, um, we issued uh, reports, uh, the governor's report, I think is going to be coming out if it hasn't already. And as I said, the criminal justice report came out and we just had our first ever conference in Harrisburg in, in December, um, which brought together a lot of people on a snowy day, I might add, um, in, in Harrisburg. But um, I think all of that, there's a lot of momentum, I think, from lots of different areas. And um, I think all of those things together bode well for the future. Great. And Tia, what about you? Uh, I think, thank you for having me go last. <laughs> I had to think about it. I think the, I think the fact that we're all here is a huge success. Um, I think the impact of, of the pandemic over the last three years has been intense in many different fields and households. And so just small successes of just being here, which is, I think, a big success for a lot of people. Um, obvious successes getting the office developed through statute um, and having it uh, be funded. Um, but to me, and, and you know, I hope Jesse can appreciate this. Um, I think one of the biggest successes to, for me to specifically point out um, the SAMHSA grant that I'm working on, um, we work with peer supports and getting them integrated into our mental health system. And this last year we certified um, six peer supports and we're able to um, integrate officially them into our electronic medical record online in our child and adolescent mental health division to get their voices to be um, documented um, and the support that they're providing um, to our youth that are receiving mental health services. They're a part, officially part of the um, electronic health record. Uh, and I think that's amazing. Um, hope for the 2023, um, uh, I think the the best thing that we can look at is really trying to address um, again mental health parity. I really hope that we um, economics is a huge issue over here. Um, our ability to um, again keep local people here um, and not have them move to the continent um, and lose that um, lose that knowledge uh, and lose that culture and lose that um, those family members because of financial um, issues and housing um, and mental health needs, uh, I think that would be a huge hope is to look at some kind of policy around how ACEs impact um, mental health and how that needs to be looked at through capturing um, and paying equitably uh, among mental health providers. Absolutely. Thank you, Tia. Very well said. All right. So I can't believe this hour has flown by. So one last question. So with all of our calls, we like to conclude with some key steps for our audience that they can, you all can be thinking about to advance healing center trauma responsive policy. So I'm going to ask quickly, what are two actionable steps um, that folks can take in their states to support this movement? And programs in 2023. And I'll, again, I'll do Jen, Rob, and Tia just quickly. Two actionable things. Jen, what are two things we can all be doing? Um, 
two things that everyone should be doing. Um, for 2023, create three new relationships with people in policy roles. Um, relationships are so key. Inside outside strategy is how we're going to get it done. Um, and then become a watchdog. I know sometimes it can be hard to read the news, but um, at CTIP, we try and filter out some of the stuff and just give you what's happening on trauma um, and just be a watchdog on what's happening in your state and how they're implementing funding. And we can give you opportunities to be proactive about outreach to encourage funding to be used in a specific way, but um, relationships and watchdog. Love it. Rob, how about you? Two actionable strategies? Well, I think that where we are is, um, you know, we need to implement a lot of the things that we've done, you know, so we've come up with lots of ideas. And now it's a question of, for example, we have a training team, which how do we actually educate? There's a whole new administration coming in. How do we make sure that all of those state agencies are trained while we're also training folks um, around the state within the counties. And I might add one thing was the legislature did pass a statute after uh, George Floyd was murdered that requires now all law enforcement officials to receive training in trauma-informed uh, policing, we'll call it. Mm -hmm. And I was able to work on the curriculum and actually develop, uh, uh, presented some trainings on that. But the bottom line is we need to get it out. So it's one thing to talk about. It's one thing to have on paper all these wonderful recommendations. Now, the next step to me is filling this world with training and understanding about uh, trauma-informed practices. Great. Thank you, Rob. All right, Tia, last word from you. Two, two, two actionable strategies. I, I think uh, uh, one major thing is we are so aware of trauma-informed principles. I, and I also, I shouldn't say we, but I am probably one of the worst persons to do self-care. Um, so I, I, I hope that people um, prioritize themselves um, so that they can be whole enough to do the work that we do on a daily basis. And secondly, I, I really hope that we can focus on action, on, on action strategy to find one person, one young person to support as a mentor and identify um, and, and pass the knowledge down um, to the next generation. We have got to, we have got to pass and share the knowledge and um, support our, our next generations to come up and do this work. Thank you, Tia. That was a great, great way to end. Um, I want to thank Rob, Jen, Jesse, and Tia. Thank you so much. You were all just incredibly uh, just they're just amazing people, as you can see. Um, and thank I want to thank everyone for joining today. Um, the recording and the slides will be posted on our website. I also want to remind everyone that on January 24th, uh, Pathways to Resilience is co-sponsoring the inaugural Center on Child Wellbeing and Trauma monthly speaker series. I think I saw someone from there on here. Um, the session is going to feature Elaine miller Karras, the executive director of the Trauma Resource Institute, who's going to talk about her community resilience model to prevent and heal trauma. Um, but thank you all so much for being here today. Thank you for your engagement in the chat. Thank you to our speakers. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.